You are listening to a sermon from Village Baptist Church in Petaluma. For more sermons like this one, please visit our website at villagebaptisthome.org. Our mission is to win people to Christ and develop them into active disciples. We pray this sermon is a blessing to you. Now let's hear today's message. There's a game on the internet that is called something along the lines of um, uh, one got to go. So you see different pictures of things and you got to choose which thing is better than the other thing. And I want us to do that this morning in a game called What's Better? Uh, what's Better? Uh, so if you, sermon notes, something happened? Oh, there we go. I was like, I don't see it. <laughs> um, so the game is called What's Better? So what we're going to do is... Uh, I'm going to show you a picture, and I'm going to tell you which, which do you think is better, the one on the right or the left. So this is going to be a game that's going to, you're going to need to know the difference between your right hand and your left hand. So uh, right hand will be a choice, and the left hand will be a choice. All right, so here we go. Number one, uh, fruit or vegetables? Fruit or vegetables? And if you're online, you can put in right or left, or you can even just write the answer in. I'll see him later. Okay. It looks like. Okay. <laughs> I see a couple of right. Some people is doing this. I don't know what that means. <laughs> you only have one. What? No, you have a right hand and you have a left hand. No, no, no. Right or left. <laughs> All right. Next one. Uh, would you summer or winter? Oh, man, it's almost all summer. we got a couple winters. The pond house is divided. Okay, let's see. All right. Uh, let's go to the next one. Uh, pancakes or waffles? <laughs> Someone said both. Not listening. Oh, my goodness. All right, next. Uh, grits or oatmeal? Wow. Uh huh. <laughs> and just in, just in case you were not, you didn't know, uh, sugar does go in grits. Praise, 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 <laughs> praise God. <laughs> praise God. All right, next one. <laughs> uh, Coke or Pepsi? Uh-huh. I know some of y'all, neither one, water. No, just choose. <laughs> All right. We're a very divided church. Next one. Uh, Olive Garden or BJ's? If you don't get this right, I'm going to preach for three hours. I'm hearing some of what y'all are saying. I don't like that. <laughs> All right, next one. Walmart, Target. <laughs> some people are very confident. <laughs> uh huh. <laughs> very divided. <laughs> All right, uh, next one. Uh, wisdom or foolishness? <laughs> this might be the first one we're all on the same page. Interesting. All right, next one. Uh, birth or death? Birth or death? Does it matter who? <laughs> Well, it seems like we're all on the same page. Some people seem a little confused. Uh, next. Uh, frustration or laughter? Frustration or laughter? Okay. I hear you, Hezekiah. <laughs> ah, pretty, we're all on the same page. Next. Uh, rebuke or praise? Rebuke, right hand, praise. What's better? 
We're kind of split on this one. Uh, next one. Uh, wedding or funeral? <laughs> Y'all gonna need this message I'm about to give you. <laughs> um, so let me ask you this question. Some of those are pretty easy, right? To know the difference between which one's better. Um, when we were kids during the summer, my mom used to give us these puzzles. They were movie poster puzzles, 300 pieces of different movie posters like 101 Dalmatians and Lion King and Aladdin and there were all these different uh, that she would give us and in order to keep us busy during the summer and after we would do them she would put the puzzle on its face and then spray it on the back with glue and then put another piece of post paper on the back and then we'd have the picture of what we put together and the thing I remember about those is the fun of doing them and seeing our the the movies that we liked. Um, but when doing a puzzle, you know this, that sometimes you have one piece and you're trying to figure out how does this piece connect to this piece. It seems like you have a picture of grass here and a face. Then you have a leg here and then you have Scott. And like, how does this relate to this? And while they're all separated, you can't really tell how they relate to one another. It's not until you put the puzzle together that you see the picture. Wisdom literature is kind of like that. When you read the book of Proverbs and when you read Job and the book that we're in, Ecclesiastes, sometimes it feels like the, the writer is just giving these random thoughts that, that are not connected. And in our text today, we're going to see that they seem to be a bunch of random thoughts and ideas. So we're going to look at different pieces of what Koheleth says. And then after we see those pieces, we're going to stand back and look at the picture that he's painting. It might seem like it's all unrelated, but they're together. And so the title of the message is Jigsaw Puzzle. So if you have a Bible, meet me in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. A little bit more than halfway through uh, the study in the book of uh, Ecclesiastes. And the, the title of the series is Grasping for Meaning. And the teacher, Koheleth, or the preacher, um, some believe it's Solomon is writing to us about life. What is the meaning of life? And can we grasp what life really means? Can we find meaning in this world? And in chapter seven, he's going to get very, very practical and specific, just like most Proverbs are. And it might seem a little disjointed at first, but it's not. So here's our first puzzle piece. The first puzzle piece is death is a great teacher. Death is a great teacher. Let's look at verse one. A good name is better than fine perfume and the day of death better than the day of birth. A good name, your reputation Have you ever been driving in the car somewhere with people, you're having a conversation, and then you hit a stretch of land that has a bunch of cows that have pooped, and the smell is filling the air? What does everybody do in the car? Oh, ew, this is disgusting, this is not, or skunks in the area. And people begin to say, oh, oh, ew, oh. Just that smell can totally disrupt the atmosphere. What happens when your name is brought up in a conversation? When you're around other people and they say, oh, what about so-and-so? Your name, your reputation, in fact, in Proverbs chapter 22, it says that a good name is actually better than fine riches, than many, many riches. An individual should care about their reputation and their character even more than they care about fine perfume. Fine perfume, it was very, very expensive in those days. He said it would be better that you had a good name rather than having fine perfume. But then these are comparative proverbs. They're comparing one thing to the other. So in the way that a good name is better than having fine perfume, he says the day of death is better than the day of birth. 
Now, we are very split on this. If Kohelet was playing what's better and he was looking at this, he would say, well, I think the day of death is better. And we would look at him crazy. What do you mean the day of death is better than the day of birth? Well, he's explaining to us. Let's look at verse 2. He says, it is better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house of feasting. For death is the destiny of everyone. The living should take this to heart. Frustration is better than laughter. Remember that question? He says it's better than laughter because a sad face is good for the heart. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of pleasure. It is better, is that word again? To heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. Like the crackling of thorns under the pot, so is the laughter of fools. This too is meaningless. How is the day of death better than the day of birth? And how, Koheleth, is going to a house of mourning better than going to a house of feasting? Back in those days, when someone died, they were um, taken care of at the house. There was no funeral homes. And so when people wanted to go and see the deceased, they would go to their house, and they would see the body. And he's saying it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to a house where they're having a party. How is that the case? How can you say it's better to be at a funeral than it is to be at a wedding? And here's what he is saying. Koheleth is saying that when you go to a funeral, it forces you to think about questions that you normally want to push to the side in the outskirts of your life. It forces you to get serious about life. Because when you're at a party, no one's thinking about anything heavy or serious. We're there to laugh. We're there to have a good time. But isn't it true that when you're at a funeral, you start to contemplate life? What's the point? Why am I here? What am I doing with my life? And everybody who goes to a funeral, the message is the same. You're next. You're looking at the box and you see the person in there and next Tuesday you could be the one in the box. No one thinks about that on the dance floor of a wedding. But it's when you're sitting in front of a casket that these questions begin to come to your mind, the questions that we don't like to think about. So when he says it's better to go to a house of mourning than to a house of feasting, he's not saying literally it's better that you go to a house of mourning than a house of feasting. He's not saying it's literally better to go to a wedding or to a wedding or to a funeral rather than a wedding. He's not saying that actually, but he's saying that when you're in these places, it forces you to really think about what life is really about. Death is a great teacher. It forces us to look at life and to look at the things that we usually want to ignore. At weddings and at parties, everybody's laughing and joking, but you know what happens? Eventually, the laughing and the joking ends. That's what he said. It's like the little nettles underneath the pot. They're crackling and making a bunch of noise, but sooner or later, they fizzle out. The laughter ends. Everybody who's laughing at the party is going home, and they still have to face the same issues and problems. Going to a house of mourning is better because it forces you to think about life. It forces you to think about the end. If you knew, if somebody told you Jesus is coming back Tuesday at 7 p.m., what would you do? I guarantee you, you ain't going to work. So I got to get this check. No. What would you do? You would probably think, man, there's a lot of things I wish I would have done. It's too late. I can't give money away now. I can't do all the good works I should have done now. At any moment, the Lord could come back. 
At any moment, he can call us home. So then how should we live in light of that? If you're thinking that, if you listen to death's sermon, you would say, I need to use my life for the glory of God here and not worry so much about laughing and joking. And he's not against laughing. He's not against joking. Remember in chapter 3, he said that there's a time for laughter. But sometimes we're laughing to keep ourselves distracted from life and the reality of it. So sitting with someone as they lament losing their job is better than celebrating with someone as they got a promotion. And sitting with somebody in their hospital bed while they are suffering is better than being next to the bed of a mother who just had her baby. Because it forces you to think about what is life really about. At the end of my life, what do I want people to say about me? At the funeral, do I want them to say things about me? Is that he cared about other people? She invested in other people's lives. And so the awkward and the tough moments in our lives are used by God to mature us. And so when you're going through something difficult, when you're going through something hard, know God is using it. In Psalm 90, in verse 12, Moses says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So death is a great teacher. Here's puzzle piece number two. Puzzle piece number two is there are pits all around you, so stay vigilant. There are pits all around you. Stay vigilant. Let me go back to verse five because I want to say this before we jump into uh, the second piece. Uh, Verse five is better to heed the rebuke of a wise person than to listen to the song of fools. No one likes to be rebuked. No one likes to have somebody show them their faults. It's terrible. It's humiliating. But it's better than having a bunch of fools around you singing your praise. And some people, that's all they do. They put people around and they only say good things about them. You're wonderful. You're awesome. You're so nice. (laughs) You need somebody in your life you're going to say, you're tripping. You're being dumb. You are mean. You need people in your life who are going to tell you the truth. Who hold up a mirror to your face. Look, look at your face. Do you have friends like that (laughs) who will tell you things about yourself? You need them. It's better than having a bunch of people around you just tell you what you want to hear. You'll end up being a fool. All right, puzzle piece two. It is, uh, what is it? There's pits all around you. Stay vigilant. Verse seven. Extortion turns a wise person into a fool and a bribe corrupts the heart. What are some of the pits? There are four of them. The first is the pit of bribery. I think all of us think we are upright, upstanding people, and I can't be bribed. When I was growing up, we used to love to watch wrestling, and there was a wrestler called Ted DiBiase, the Million Dollar Man, and he had a saying, everybody's got a price. And what he would do, he would use his money. He had designer clothes, all this money. He would use his money to pay people off, like the refs and other wrestlers, in order to win his matches. And he said, everybody has a price. What's your price? I was watching a superhero TV show, and one of the police captains was working with the villain. And when he was confronted about it, he said, the reason I did it is because the villain, he threatened my daughter. So that was his price. There was a pastor who was being pranked, and they came to him and they said, hey, we'll take care of that little legal issue you have if you just skim some money off of the offering each week and give it to us. Now, thank God he didn't do it, but there are many pastors who have. And in your life, you're going to come to a point where somebody's going to offer you something for your integrity. Hey, just look the other way. So as you're trying to walk before God, be aware, be, beware of the pit of bribery. Here's the second pit, the pit of impatience and pride. Verse 8, the end of a matter is better than its beginning, and patience is better than pride. The end is better 
than the beginning. How in the world is, can he say the end is better than the beginning? Think about it. You ever been in a race? Isn't getting to the end better than the beginning? Yeah. Ever tried to lose weight? Isn't being at the end of that <laughs> better than the beginning? What he's saying is anything that is worthwhile takes process, but when you go through the process at the end, there is a lot that you have learned and there are results that happen. So stop being so impatient and stop being prideful thinking you can take shortcuts. The path to being a man or woman of integrity, sometimes God will take you the long way. Stop looking for all the shortcuts. Because the thing that you're going to learn about the things that come to us is that sometimes Satan, he comes to us and he shows us something that is supposed to enhance our life, make us better, pull us up the corporate ladder. But he never comes dragging the chains that will enslave us. He always comes to us. He says, oh, this is going to be great. And it starts out great. But what happens in the end? It's bitter. Sometimes the way God does his things are more like Sour Patch Kids. They start sour, but then they're sweet. And God's way, though sometimes it's difficult, in the end you got to know that it's better. So the pit of impatience. Then third, there's the pit of anger. Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. You ever drive with one of these people? Someone who has an anger issue, they're going to get you shot. They're grabbing the steering wheel, yelling, doing stuff when they roll down the window. Now, the Bible doesn't say that to be angry is sinful. He says, don't sin while you are angry. So anger is not the issue. It's being quickly angered, quickly provoked in your spirit. Uh, Ephesians 4.26, do not let the sun go down. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. You notice how the devil comes in the context of anger? The devil is not far from one who lights up quickly with anger. Here's the next pit, the pit of nostalgia. Pit of nostalgia, verse 10. Do not say, why were the old days better than these? For it is not wise to ask such questions. People always talk about all the good old days. <laughs> all the good old days back when. <laughs> he says, that's not wise to ask why. It's not like the days before. Oh, you remember when you were a kid, you grew up, and it was so much simpler. You woke up on Saturday Pour yourself some cereal, some milk, and watch your cartoons. Oh, it was a much simpler time. You remember back in the day when gas was only... You remember back in the day when we didn't have to lock our doors? Now, here's, here's the problem with nostalgia. Nostalgia is looking back at something and remembering the good things about it. The problem is nostalgia lies to you because you don't remember that there are also bad things. You only, it's looking back in the future with rose-colored glasses. It was all so wonderful and beautiful. But every era has its problems. Just because, it, listen, gas was cheaper a long time ago. But you think wickedness still wasn't around? It's, it makes no sense to look back to the past. C.S. Lewis said that nostalgia is the special emotion of longing and it is always bittersweet. When we feel nostalgia, we experience a feeling of something lost. Yet, at the same time, it's a beautiful perception of what has been lost. And so we long for it. Nostalgia, it takes a vacation to the past, ignoring the present and perhaps God's purpose in it. Maybe God has a purpose in what we're going through in this day, and we're not supposed to be always looking back to the old days. This is the problem that the Israelites had, right? They're in the desert, and they're going through difficulties. They say, oh, it was so much better when we were in Egypt. We could have onions and garlic and meat. It was so wonderful, wasn't it? Yeah, it was so wonderful. Somebody in the back said, ah, weren't we slaves? <laughs> Under a brutal leader who 
killed our children? Like, they didn't remember that. We do it with the early church. Oh, if we could just go back to the days of the early church. There was a lot of miracles. But they also threw us to the lions. I've never heard anybody say, oh, Lord, we want to go back to the time when they threw us the lions. As great as the early days were, but God is the same God that he was back then, and he can do things now. He doesn't need to go back to the past. So we got to stop living in the past. God, what are you doing now? What are you doing today? And let's see what you're doing here in this moment and not always looking to the past as if the past didn't have its issues and problems too. Here we go. Puzzle piece number three. Wisdom is a good thing, so pursue it. Wisdom is a good thing, so pursue it. Look at verse 11. Wisdom, like an inheritance, is a good thing and benefits those who see the sun. Wisdom is a shelter as money is a shelter, but the advantage of knowledge is this. Wisdom preserves those who have it. Wisdom is a good thing, so pursue it. Did you know it's, a, it's like an inheritance? It's a good thing. Inheritance Money is not a bad thing. We talked about last week that the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, not money itself. It's a good thing for you to save up for your children. It's a good thing for you to have savings. Inheritance is a good thing. The issue is putting all of your hope and all of your trust in wealth. It's a shelter. Money is a shelter. You're living in a place that is paid for with money that gives you shelter. Shelter is a great thing. But what he says is wisdom is even better because what wisdom does is it per actually preserves your life. Spiritual things are actually real and we need protection from those things. And so we need to walk wisely and he says it's a good thing so you need to pursue it. Just like you pursue money and you're trying to do all you can to make money, you also need to pursue after wisdom because it actually does good in your life. Jump down to verse 19. It says, wisdom makes one wise person more powerful than 10 rulers of a city. You say, oh, well, two heads are better than one. Give me one wise person against 10 stupid people <laughs> in a city that all have their, one wise person is more powerful. It's the power of wisdom. So get wisdom. Pursue it because it will make you powerful and strong. Puzzle piece number four is acknowledge the sovereignty of of God. Acknowledge the sovereignty of God. Verse 13, consider what God has done. Who can straighten what he has made crooked? When times are good, be happy. But when times are bad, consider this. God has made the one as well as the other. Therefore, no one can discover anything about the future. Acknowledge the sovereignty of God. We've talked about this in a previous message and even in the last message that reality is the way it is. God is going to do what he's going to do. He's sovereign. He's in control of all things. And so we need to humble ourselves and just trust that he's good. If we don't acknowledge the sovereignty of God, we're going to be very miserable. He says, when things are going well, be happy. Things going well for you right now? If they're going good for you right now, be happy. Praise God for that. Be happy. But our problem, though, is when the bad stuff happens. When the bad stuff happens, we start saying things like, the devil's after me. <laughs> Feels like, the, is the devil always doing stuff? He does some stuff. But he's not doing everything. The things that come into your life are coming to you from the good and sovereign hand of God. I've said it before. Nothing comes into your life that hasn't crossed God's desk and he hasn't given his stamp of approval on it. Nothing. Think of Job. Remember what Job said to his wife? How are we going to accept good and not bad? He understood this bad is coming to us from God. Someone said, no, it was Satan. Read the text. It said Satan. No, Satan had to get a permission slip to do what he did. He can't do anything. So that even the devil is under the sovereign rule of God. Luther said that the devil is God's devil. There's nothing that the devil can do to you that God doesn't allow. He's not more powerful. The idea of God and the devil being two equal forces is not true. It's not scripture. The devil is a created being. God created him, and he has all power over him. 
Right? They're not fighting in the heavens. Oh, who's going to win? It's not that. God could flick him. <laughs> but he's using him in order to do something in the world. And yeah, we can't understand it. Yeah, it doesn't make any sense to us, but God sometimes doesn't make any sense to us. Listen to these scriptures, Isaiah 14, 27. For the Lord Almighty has purpose, and who can thwart him? His hand is stretched out, and who can turn it back? Who going to tell God, what are you doing? Ah, take your hand off that. Stop. You can't do that to the Lord. If he, uh, Job 9, 12, if he snatches away, who can stop him? Who can say to him, what are you doing? Job 12, 14, what he tears down cannot be rebuilt. Those who he imprisons cannot be released. So we serve a God who is sovereign, in control, and we just need to acknowledge that. Puzzle piece number five, live a balanced life. Live a balanced life. Verse 15, in this meaningless life of mine, I have seen both of these. The righteous perishing in their righteousness and the wicked living long in their wickedness. Do not be over-righteous, neither be over-wise. Why destroy yourself? Do not be over-wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? It is good to grasp the one and not let go of the other. Whoever fears God will avoid all extremes. Live a balanced life. Here's something that I've seen and you've seen and Koheleth has seen. Sometimes people who live righteously, who are living for God, die young. People who are living for God, trusting God, terrible things happen to them. And then you also see people who are living wickedly. Nothing goes wrong for them, seems like. They're perfectly healthy, have all of the money. The person who's serving God is struggling. The person who doesn't serve God, hates God, curses God, seems like everything is going well for them. And when we see that, we say, how does that make sense? Lord, forgive us, but have you ever seen someone doing well, having all this, and someone that you love, a friend, a, a family member, dies, and you say, Lord, why couldn't you have taken them? I mean, just be honest. This person is a scoundrel, and you let them live. This person was living for you, trusted you, was at church Sunday after Sunday, gave, gave everything they have, and now they're gone, and here's this person, they're not doing any of that, are probably going to die, still loving all that stuff, and nothing has happened to them. And so when we see those kind of things, what's our reaction to that? It's difficult to watch, difficult to see. It's hard to fathom, Lord, why would you allow that to happen? And so what do we do? He says, one thing he says is do not be over-righteous. Because the response to that is say, well, in order for that not to, I need to make sure I'm doing everything I can to be righteous. Don't be over-righteous, he says. What does that mean? Don't be captain super saved. <laughs> there are some people <laughs> who, they, they way too saved. <laughs> Why do you have a TV? Is not the Lord enough for you? <laughs> You're only fasting six hours? I've been on a 40-day fast. This is... No, no food, no water. How, I've been at church since 7 a.m. this morning, and you got here at 11. What, what kind of Christian are you? The over-righteous person is the person who adds to the Scripture. They take what God has said, and they add to it. Where does the Bible say that you can't watch movies that ain't about Jesus? Now, I will say that you're probably going to be better off if you're not filling your mind with a bunch of trash on television. Because some of us, we watch way too much TV, way too many movies. We could do better knowing more about the Bible. We could do a lot better. But it's wrong to say, well, the, the only way you can be a real Christian, super Christian, you gotta, all you do is read the Bible. Don't be over right. Just don't be the kind of person who's adding on to the scriptures, more than God has said to do. And these kind of people, they burn us out. Because everything is just so, so serious. You don't want to invite them because they're going to be asking questions like, why do we have this? Why? Don't be overwrite. That's not the way to react. But here's the opposite. He says, do not, and, uh, and when he says, don't be over, over righteous, 
um, or over wise, why destroy yourself? You're just going to destroy yourself. But do not be over wicked and do not be a fool. Why die before your time? Now, when he says do not be over wicked, he is not suggesting wickedness in moderation. <laughs> Teenagers, don't come to your mom. I'm just being a little wicked. What is he saying when he says don't be over wicked? He's saying that, and he'll say this later, that we are all sinners. You are a sinner. You're going to sin. And because you're going to sin, just own that. This is going to be part of my life. But you don't have to be a serial killer. There's a way to sin that understands this is my nature. This is part of, of who I am in the world. But I don't have to take sin to this, to this level. And he says, why die before your time? It's true that some people are living righteously and they die young. But it's also true some people are living foolishly and they die before their time because they're doing something foolish. Playing in traffic might be fun, but it can kill you. Just because you're having fun, just because you're doing things that are enjoyable doesn't mean it's, it's wise. So don't be overly righteous. Don't be overly wicked. Be balanced. It's, it doesn't make sense to go to one extreme or the other. Here's puzzle piece number six. Stop being so sensitive. Stop being so sensitive. Verse 20. Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous. No one who does what is right and never sins. Do not pay attention to every word people say, or you may hear your servant cursing you. For you know in your heart that many times you yourself has cursed others. Amen. Sometimes we don't want to hold people to the same standard that we hold them to. Hmm. Yeah, over there, talking about people. They just out there just talking about people. Talk about people in the church. Just be out there just... just I know they're talking about people. I know they talk about me. And someone next to you like, you talk about people. What are you talking about? Isn't it true? He's saying, he's saying, don't put your ear to the door to hear what somebody is saying because you might hear your, your friend saying something about you. She is so stuck up. She is so needy. And what is he saying? He's saying, don't, don't hear that. And judge them based off of that because you know you, yourself, you thought those same things and said those things too. Yeah. Yeah. Charles Spurgeon in his um, lectures to my students, he was talking to the different pastors there and he talked about having the blind eye and a deaf ear. A blind eye and a deaf ear. That in ministry, you want to make sure that you're blinded to some things and you're deaf to some things. Because if you're not, you're, going, you're not going to make it in ministry. I can't tell you how many times I watched my dad say nothing as people slandered him. On Facebook. What kind of pastor is this? And I said, Dad, can I say something? I'm assistant pastor. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not the lead pastor. I can say something. He said, no. It's crazy. Sometimes you have to hear people say things and you can't defend yourself, can't say anything. You just have to let it happen. But this is the one thing you know. You know that you yourself have done those things to other people. So don't be so sensitive. You don't want to be judged by your worst moments. So don't judge people by their worst moments. Glad to have the new baby. <laughs> So precious. All right. Puzzle piece number seven. Getting wisdom will be tough. Getting wisdom will be tough. Verse 23. All this I tested by wisdom and said, I am determined to be wise, but this was beyond me. Whatever exists is far off and most profound. Who can discover it? If you've ever tried to search for something that is valuable, you know something that can be difficult to get your hands on. Remember those little rubber bouncy balls that you would throw and they had a lot of bounce and they would bounce all over the place? We used to do that with the kids. Throw the ball and it would go to this way, bounce and go left and bounce and go right and they'd be, ah, try to get it. I think wisdom, trying to get wisdom was like that. You think, oh, I got it, I understand. And then you hit a situation like, man, I don't understand. Chasing out, he said, it was beyond me. This is Solomon. He's the most, he's the, 
most wise person to ever walk the earth. He said, wisdom was beyond me. So if, you, if you're today, if you're trying to, to be wise, to, to get wisdom, understand that it's going to be hard. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be tough to get. The last piece, humanity is sinful. Verse 25, so I turned my mind to understand, to investigate, and to search out wisdom and the scheme of things and to understand the stupidity of wickedness and the madness of folly. I find more bitter than death the woman who is a snare, whose heart is a trap, and whose hands are chains. The man who pleases God will escape her, but the sinner she will ensnare. Solomon talks a lot about this woman. She stands outside of her house. She looks through the uh, curtains and says, yoo to the, to the stupid boy walking through the, <laughs> through the town. Woo-hoo-hoo. Come, come inside. He says, he knows there's a lot of women like this in that time. He says, look, says the teacher, this is what I have discovered. Verse 28, adding one thing to another to discover the scheme of things. While I was still searching but not finding, I, f- I found one upright man among a thousand. He's looking for someone who's upright. I said, I found one, but not one upright woman among them all. Now, before you take his head off, don't think that Koelth is saying that there are no righteous women. You know that in Proverbs 31, he writes about the the woman. He talks about a a woman uh, or a wife who is upright is to be praised. So he's he's not against women. He's just saying in this particular search, he didn't find any. And it's interesting, he uses the the number 1,000 because he had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So maybe he went through his harem and his wives. I couldn't find one woman. I don't know. But in this, in this chase, he's saying, I couldn't find one upright woman. And again, I think this is more about him than it says about the ladies. Verse 29, this only I have found. God created mankind upright, but they have gone in search of many schemes. Humanity is sinful. You try and find somebody who's upright, and all you see is a bunch of wickedness. Finding people who will do the right things, be men and women of integrity, is difficult and hard to find. And that's not something that I didn't even need to talk a lot about because this is something that we all know. This is something that we all experience, the sinfulness of humanity. He created man in the beginning. And instead of listening to what he said, they went after many schemes. They rebelled against his command. And so with these eight pieces, we put the, pi- the picture together. What do we see? If you take me to an art gallery and you put me in front of some abstract art and say, hey, what do you see? I will probably say, Mmm, I see so much. Oh, hmm. I understand what he's trying to do there. That's why, like, sometimes, like, you know, we've been stuck places with with uh, Oren. He's like, there's different exhibits, and I'm looking at stuff. I'm like, I don't get it. I don't get it. And he's just like, yes, mm, that's great. That's, that's hard. Mm-hmm. Ah, yes. And I'm just like, mm hmm. <laughs> I don't know what he's talking about. I understand this stuff. <laughs> it's abstract. I don't know. I'll be acting like I know. I don't know. So when I say, what picture do we see? You're like, oh, yes. Yeah, so, um, see the beauty of the Lord. I, I don't know what to see. Wisdom literature is like that, right? You get to the end, you're like, what did I just read? And it's not going to take a sermon or a few moments to try and take everything that we just said in. But what's the picture that we see? One of the things that you see in chapter 7 is that he is comparing the difference between how one person approaches life and the other. One is wise and the other is a fool. You'll see this term over and over and over in this text. The wise or the fool uses wisdom and folly. What is wisdom? Wisdom is taking life's situations and how do I respond to life's situations 
And do I respond in the way God would want me to? And different things that come our way, we can, act, we can respond with wisdom or we can respond with folly. And he's saying the difference between the man of wisdom and the man or the woman of folly is how they respond to the things that come in their life. So these different pieces are different parts of our lives. And how are we going to respond? How, when someone dies, what do you, how do you respond? When someone talks about you, how do you respond? When you're walking in the path, how do you deal with bribes? How do you deal with longing for threat? All these things are the difference between how somebody who is wise and how someone who is foolish. And the, the, the goal here is get wisdom, search for it, pursue it, because it will make you strong. But even if we get wisdom, what do we recognize? Even if we get it, it's still not able to satisfy us. You can be the wisest person on earth and still say, what is the point? So then what is it that we need? 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 30. Listen to Paul. He says, it is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Chapter 7 should make you long for the gospel because you say, man, I cannot live the way God wants me to live. I can't respond to everything that happens in the way God would have me respond. I can search for it. I can try to. But in the end, it's going to be I have to have the righteousness of someone else. Everything in the book of Ecclesiastes is pointing us to the future of the one who will come and actually give life meaning. What meaning is not found in wisdom. You can search for it, you can have it, and still find yourself in your sin. And so today, as we look at the picture of a man or a woman of wisdom, and we want to pursue that, let us pursue even more the wisdom that comes from God in the person of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Thank you for listening. If you would love to hear more sermons like this one or find out more about our church, please visit us at villagebaptisthome.org. Until next time, take care and God bless.